you, Joe, for giving me hope, and thank you for being here, and I'm really looking forward to hearing about your most recent installment. the U.S. Department of Justice reported that the city of Ferguson, Missouri was operating what it called a predatory system of government. Police were acting as street-level enforcers for a program. They used fines and fees to extract resources for poor communities of color and deliver them to municipal coffers. Three features of this regime stood out. First, the targeting and scale of the operation. Black residents were clearly targeted, making up 90% of those taken in for public safety violation. With the city averaging three warrants per household, three warrants per household, fines and fees became almost universal experiences for poor black residents. Payments were pursued so aggressively that they made up one fifth of the city's entire revenue base in 2013. Second of all, the intentional top down nature of the operation. The DOJ report concludes Ferguson's law enforcement is, quote, Ferguson's law enforcement practices are shaped by the city's focus on revenue rather than by public safety needs. The city budgets for sizable increases in municipal fines and fees each year, exhorts police and court staff to deliver those revenue increases, and closely monitors whether those increases are achieved. And third of all, the city's construction and exploitation of debt. Even when subjected to minor fees or fines, Ferguson residents often became ensnared in a perpetual debt trap that led to ongoing entanglements with the criminal justice system and generated ongoing revenues for the city. Well, how could this be? Many observers asked in shock. The entire story struck many as deeply un-American and sharply at odds with how governance normally works in American life, and indeed, it was an image of American governance that was deeply at odds with the image in my own subfield where we love study of U.S. politics and political science. Against this view, Josh and I argue that Ferguson's regime of plunder was no anomaly. Instead, it reveals a broad complex of predatory criminal justice practices that is widespread and worthy of far more critical analysis than it has received. So let's begin with a descriptive question. How substantial are these practices and how have they grown over time? In America today, roughly 10 million people owe a total of about $50 billion in criminal justice debt, and they make nearly $40 billion in payments on these debts each year. The revenues they generate flow not only to governments, but also to a wide array of for-profit firms operating throughout the criminal justice system. Not surprisingly, given what we know about this system, the burdens of this resource extraction regime are disproportionately borne by poor people of color. The financialization of criminal justice has grown both wider and deeper over the past 25 years, with a burst of onset in the early to mid-1990s and a period of rapid expansion after 9-11-2001 and then again um, after the Great Recession that started in 2007. Consider a few trends for some of the most important sites of extraction. I'll start with fines and fees. From 1991 to 2004, the percent of prisoners reporting legal financial obligations rose from 25% to 66%. Today, all 50 states defray their prison costs by charging prisoners some sort of pay to stay fee, almost always charging those prisoners for room and board, but in some states also for medical care, clothing, and basic needs such as menstrual pads. To secure payments for these fees, officials can seize virtually any money prisoner might receive. They take percentages of the deposits that we make in prisoners' accounts. They seize funds received through the death of a relative, a legal settlement, or even a work of art. In 2018, for example, an imprisoned author named Curtis Dawkins received a 
$150,000 advance for his acclaimed short story collection, The Gray Bar Hotel. I highly recommend it. It's an excellent collection of short stories. Um, he took that money, that $150,000, he went to put in an account for his children, his two children, uh, his education. And instead, the state of Michigan sees 90% of that total sum to pay them back for the cost of imprisoning. In most cases, paying state fees simply produce debts, which states may pursue as reimbursements for years after a prisoner is released. This practice is especially common in juvenile systems, where parents may be billed for years after the end of a child's incarceration. From 1990 to 2014, the number of states charging people for their own probation and parole, in addition to prison state pay to stay, rose from 26 to 44. Some states now charge defendants extra fees to exercise their right to a jury trial or to use a public defender. These rights remain on the books as rights of citizenship, but they have been converted into consumer rights to purchase. Bail charges also grew dramatically, in number and size over the past 25 years, funneling poor people's money to a handful of large insurance corporations, even in cases where no one is found guilty of a crime. Now, I'll not say much more about bail in this talk, but some of you uh, have access to um, an article that was recently published. Um, my co-author in the study, Josh Page, conducted ethnographic research, uh, working as a bail bond agent for a year and a half. Um, and we use that within the, within the broader book to look at frontline processes of, of predation um, and the way in which people also uh, become comfortable with the work they do of that sort. Um, I'm happy to talk about that uh, after the talk. Now, um, at each step along the way, as actors create new points of resource extraction, others try to piggyback on it to get revenues for themselves. The process acts as a force multiplier for monetary transfers out of poor communities. Consider as a small example what happens when you're on a stop sign in California. The base fine for failing to stop at the sign is $35, right? But over time, state and local agencies have added 12 different fees and charges on top of that fine, many of which have no discernible relation whatsoever to processing the violation. They simply represent the revenue needs of various cash card agencies. In the end, after all the various agencies have gotten in on the action, the fine that has to be paid for running the stop sign is down $35 is $238. For consider simple asset forfeiture. This procedure emerged from the war on drugs and the accelerated under the war on terror. Um, it allows authorities to seize any assets they suspect have domestic origins. The burden of proof is that on the owner to show, through costly court challenge, that the assets have no criminal history. The total value of seized assets rose sharply between 2004 and 2010, reaching $1.1 billion in 2013 alone. Between 2001 and 2013, $2.1 billion in assets were seized from people who were not even charged with any crime. At the local level, from 2011 to 2013, Chicago police brought in nearly $72 million in cash and assets this way. The money was coming in so fast that they actually used part of it to buy a cash counting machine for the police department to process things more efficiently. And they use some of the slushy funds, and here comes, here's an issue of democratic account accountability. They use some of the slushy funds from asset forfeiture to buy themselves controversial surveillance, controversial surveillance equipment that the city council had actually declined to approve. Here in Philadelphia, between 2011 and 2013, city officials confiscated some 100 homes 150 vehicles, and roughly $4 million in cash each year. Most of these seizures involve small amounts taken from people in Philadelphia's poor communities of color. A study that drew a random sample of 350 cash for forfeitures uh, during this period, made in 2012 and 2013, revealed that half of all cash forfeitures were for less than $192. They're stopping people and taking small amounts on the street, more or less. Consider prison-based profits. Alongside government takings, prison profiteering by market firms has risen dramatically. Today, prison management contracts alone represent a $5 billion industry with additional revenues coming in the areas of immigration and asylum seeking. Private prison firms now manage over 60% of immigration detention beds. Between 2008 and 2016, contracts with Immigration and Customs Enforcement ICE generated a total of about $1.8 billion 
in revenues for just the top two corporate providers. And these profits have increased considerably under the Trump administration's crackdown. In so-called public prisons as well, state authorities have moved to commodify their control of human bodies and sell extraction rights to market firms. Prisoners have needs, and prisoners can be put to work. By purchasing access, often in monopoly form, firms are able to exploit prisoners first as unpaid labor, and second and more deeply as a captive market for overpriced goods. Consider prison phone calls. Capitalizing on inmates' efforts to maintain their social and family ties, companies charge exorbitant permanent rates for prison phone calls. The annual value of the industry is estimated at $1.2 billion, with commissions to government totaling more than $460 million a year. In many cases, firms work to construct new opportunities uh, for these markets in creative ways. For example, the new prison market in video interfaces. By arguing that old practices of free in-person visitation posed a security risk, market firms channeled social needs that were already being met for free in a more profitable digital formats. In this way, the basic need to maintain contact with loved ones became integrated into the field of financial extraction. The, con the conversion to fee-based video visitation is now supplanting uh, free personal visits in prisons around the country. And the same process is happening for reading. Increasingly, state prison systems are banning donations to free prison libraries and forcing prisoners to buy ebooks and tablets to read them on instead. In other cases, firms leverage the threat of prison to reduce market for sales under duress. Consider, for example, the case of Vivitrol, a drug that Alchemy's Incorporated developed over a decade ago to curb drug and alcohol addiction. After years of failing to build the market with doctors and patients and failing to achieve strong results in controlled trials, Alchemy's worked to gain a foothold in the criminal justice system as a site where individuals could be compelled to buy the product. In courts, judges offer defendants a simple choice. Take the shot and pay for it or go to jail. The strategy has proved so successful in the past five years that roughly 30,000 people in the system are now receiving Vivitrol shots. From 2012 to 2017, the firm's stock market value soared from about $2.5 billion to more than $9 billion. Now you go on and on and painfully on. Um, but this quick survey is sufficient to establish a timeline and suggest the scale and diversity of what we're talking about here. So I'll turn then to a more direct consideration of some of the consequences of these practices. For now, three general points will have to stand in for a broader discussion. First, to appreciate the full consequences, we have to pay attention to how predatory criminal justice practices set cascades of debt, and hardship, and crisis in motion. An initial violation carries a fine, which leads to court appearance fees, which then may usher the individual into the expensive world of the bail industry, which then produces debts that cannot be easily paid, and these debts, in turn, lead to new entanglements with the courts, additional fines and fees, endless payments, and in some cases, debt-based imprisonment. And as debts mount, the significant others that surround the individual who may not even have been charged or arrested for anything, the significant others that surround the individual are drawn into the orbit of extraction. Social networks become the infrastructure for a cascade of financial takings. Limited resources throughout the network and the community are drained out, often with devastating consequences. Second, it's here, in focusing on the people who come to bear the financial burdens of predation, that intersectional gender analysis becomes essential for getting the story right. Although men of color are disproportionately targeted by our criminal justice system, it is more often women, and especially women of color, who shoulder the financial burdens. Roughly one in four women in the U.S. have a family member in prison. The number that rises to 44% among black women. And women make up an estimated 83% of family members covering costs for incarcerated populations. It's typically women who co-sign the bail contracts and wind up on the hook, who cover the fines and fees and prison charges while men are incarcerated, and who take on additional debts when the men return to the community for an ex-felon and often find that they're unable to secure the work. Among families trying to maintain contact with a prison inmate, an estimated one in three goes into debt. And in states such as Florida and Wisconsin, the unpaid criminal justice debts of ex-prisoners who die 
transferred to their families after death. Payments on these deaths leave many women unable to keep up with living expenses, including food, utilities, and rent, and often play a role in pushing families toward eviction. And in fact, in some cities now, they're passing ordinances that say that if you haven't paid off all of your criminal justice and debts, and they can shut off your utilities for that reason alone, even if you could pay your utility bill. <laughs> so the practices I described are equally consequential for citizenship and political relationships to the state. On one side, these practices operate as an oppressive form of social control that takes away freedoms, rights, and resources. And in this sense, they work to deepen civic marginalization, exclusion, Disempowerment. On the other side, these practices also operate as a productive force that constructs new power relations, subject positions, and terms of civic standing. The practices in question do not simply take through force. They generate legal violations and define growing numbers of people as civic violators, working as a form of what Nancy Fraser calls political subjectivation to produce categories of people designated for expropriation debt-based disciplinary practices. Through this process, the terms of citizenship are refracted through the lens of debt in ways that reconstruct both the moral and the material dimensions of civic standing. Criminal justice debt itself becomes the marker of a distinctive civic status rooted in violation of the social contract and therefore punishable in its own right. The drive to generate revenues has a corrupting effect on institutions responsible for policing and governing the poor. In Ferguson, for example, the DOJ concluded that the courts had ceased to, quote, act as a neutral arbiter of the law or a check on unlawful police conduct. The drive to collect payments has undermined the full citizen's constitutional guarantee against being imprisoned for debts, in practice, at least. In some states, people may be deprived of the right to vote as well, for no reason other than the fact that they have not been able pay off their criminal justice debts. In fact, as some of you likely know, when Florida voters used a statewide ballot in 2018 to restore voting rights to people who had completed their felony sentences, Republicans quickly stripped these rights once again by passing law, a law saying that felons have not, who have not completed their sentence, I'm sorry, saying that felons have actually not completed their sentence until their criminal justice debts are paid in full. And at the time of passage, a Florida governor Analysis estimated that fully 83% of the people affected were highly unlikely to, likely to ever have the means to eliminate their debt. <coughs> Predatory criminal justice practices also have a corrupting effect on citizen orientations, undermining community trust, cultivating fear and avoidance of public authorities, and fueling anger and resentment alongside expectations of injustice. Through all these processes and more, Predation works to deepen civic marginalization and disempowerment. Predatory policing is especially corrosive to what Evelyn, Evelyn and Nakano Glenn call substantive citizenship because it undercuts the most basic abilities to move around freely and safely in one's community. Consider just a few findings from local investigations of monetary police citations. A DOJ study of Baltimore car stops from 2010 to 15 found that the BPD was handing out citations to drivers by the thousands. The fines were so prevalent in some neighborhoods that 410 drivers were stopped at least 10 times during this period. 95% of those drivers stopped 10 times or more were African American. The same is true of biking. A 2015 investigation found the police in Tampa, Florida had written 2,504 bike tickets in the past three years with 80% issued to black residents for violations such as riding too far from the curb, riding on the sidewalk, riding without hands on the handlebars, failing to have a bike lane, or carrying a friend on the handlebars. A similar investigation in Chicago revealed that among the areas with the highest rates of biking tickets, not a single majority white area ranked in the top 10, despite biking's popularity in white areas. Pedestrians don't fare much better. A 2017 investigation of the Jacksonville, Florida Sheriff's Office, for example, found that it issues hundreds of pedestrian citations a year, drawing on an array of 28 separate statutes governing how people get around on foot. In many cities, these sorts of citations have become standard elements of saturation of policing operations that manage and discipline the ordinary comings and goings of targeted residents. Now, having said a fair amount about 
before practices and effects, I want to turn now to two deeper questions of historical and theoretical analysis. First, how should we conceptualize these extractive practices and place them in modern historical perspective? And second, returning to the contemporary period, how should we explain why these specific practices emerged in the form they did and when they did? On the first question, we can begin from what the institutional economist Douglas North describes as a distinction between contract and predatory conceptions of the state. Contract views of the state, of course, can be traced back to the European social contract theorists of the early modern period. They supply the liberal democratic image of the state that frames most mainstream studies of U.S. politics and political economy today. State and society in this view are organized through political consent and bargaining. Politics centers on processes of citizen participation, and interest competition, and political representation. Economic development is pursued through establishment of property rights, enforcement of contracts, investments in collective infrastructure, and so on. The state is supportive of the liberal equalities of democratic citizenship on one side, and the liberal inequalities of market economies on the other. We see the broad contours of this model, for example, in T.H. Marshall's conception of how state institutions express and secure qualities of citizenship in the midst of class inequalities. We see in Robert Dahl's image of a polyarch that approximates democracy amid unequal resource distributions, and in John Wall's image of state and society as a flawed, but more or less cooperative venture for mutual advantage. Predatory conceptions of the state paint a very different picture. Ruling authorities in this view use their control of state powers to enrich themselves and allied groups. The predatory state operates in many respects as an agent of oppression and a tool of extraction, serving the interests of dominant groups in relation to subordinate populations. First, resource streams are a precondition of and thus a central project of state making and government and governance. The need for revenues draws the state into targeted expropriated projects and creates a structural need to support the forms of capital accumulation on which tax revenues depend. Second, although dominant groups may be subject to effective political opposition, they typically shape state action in ways that enrich and protect themselves at the expense of supporting groups. And third, in the civic realm, state practices tend to distinguish and empower members of dominant groups as the real citizens, who are set apart by the civic exclusion and subordination of others. Now, Douglas North's distinction is helpful for summarizing some very, very broad contrast in conceptions of the state. And insofar as his framework has been applied mostly to extractive authoritarian and or colonial regimes in the global south, there's a lot to be gained, I think, by applying the concept of a predatory state in the context of the US. As a framework for understanding how relations and practices actually work in different eras of racial capitalism, though, Josh and I argue that North's framing has significant limitations. First, North's account focuses narrowly on the state, treating it as an independent structuring force in the ordering of economic relations. In so doing, this approach obscures the other side of this co-constitutive relationship. That is, how the changing organization of capitalism defines the structural conditions and dispositions of the capitalist state. It also obscures the various ways predatory relations of dispossession have operated not just as a state project, but as an ongoing constitutive element of capitalism itself. It obscures the historical prevalence of public-private partnership in predatory collaborations, and it obscures the foundational roles that race, gender, and other axes of oppression have played in delineating and positioning targets of expropriation. For North, contract and predatory states are opposites. At a given point in time, either one or the other prevails. North seeks to understand how each type works, works to explain how, um, I'm sorry, how each type works, and explain, as a historical matter, how institutional changes eventually banish the predatory state and establish the whole progress under contract state. In contrast, we follow scholars of racial capitalism such as W.E.B. Du Bois and Cedric Robinson, who focus less on claims about the essential nature of the state and instead put concrete practices of governance, subjugation, and exploitation at the center of analysis. Drawing on scholars such as Carol Payton and Charles Mills and more recent scholarship on settler colonialism, 
we pursue more generative ways to think about how about the evolving coexistence of contract and domination. To ask how liberal terms of social contract for some may presume and be organized around predatory relationships with others. Drawing on these traditions, it's possible to approach criminal justice predation today. And I think understanding more deeply through an account of how the celebrated liberal history of American development has always been premised in varying, varying ways on a less acknowledged history of predatory governance and his possession focused on subjugated groups. So Richard Young and Jeffrey Miser, for example, argue that the early Anglo-American state can be best described as a dual state. A predatory state is dealing with non-white Americans, but a contract state in respect to to, um, I'm sorry, a contract state in respect to the internal governance of the dominant group, Anglo-American males. The contract state that promoted the growth of a prosperous liberal democratic society of Anglo-Americans was made possible, they argue, through a predatory state that financed white liberal society through its ruthless exploitation of Indian lands and African-American labor. In many ways, Young and Miser's insightful analysis jives with Du Bois's argument in Black Reconstruction in America, that the enslaved labor of black workers, quote, became the foundation stone not only of the Southern social structure, but of Northern manufacturing commerce, of the English family, of the English factory system, of European commerce, of buying and selling on a worldwide scale. Brutal expropriations of indigenous lands and black labor were not a separate matter from the rise of capitalism and liberal white democratic citizenship in America. They were foundational constitutive conditions of their development. Reflecting on these entwined elements of the political economy, critical theorists have also explored, explored the ongoing challenge visible from the outset of how dominant groups could justify predatory takings while maintaining an ideological self-image of the U.S. as a thoroughly liberal contract state. Solutions came in many forms. White elites deployed the doctrine of terra nullius, for example, to deem native lands uninhabited and ungoverned, and thus existing in a quasi-state of nature, legitimately available for the taking. Concepts of blame and underdevelopment would come to play a very similar ideological role in the mid-20th century in projects of dispossession that advanced under the banner of urban renewal, or as James Baldwin and many community activists called them, projects of Negro removal. Constructions of racial difference in the early republic were themselves fashioned and deployed to advance and justify the violent expropriation of labor and land and to construct a, delivered, a, a delimited white male harmful democracy. <coughs> Public officials used state laws and policies and delineations of citizenship to advance and legitimate predation in ways that made their violent takings appear to themselves and other elites both legal and morally defensible. Such practices enabled and justified the disposition of Mexicans in the Southwest, the extraction of Chinese labor for the development of mines and railroads. And from the outset, predation was organized not just by race and class, but by gender as well. From the 1840s into the early 1900s, poor women deemed morally sinful were frequently placed in Catholic institutions known as Magdalene Laundries, forerunners of today's American scope of today's women's prisons, where incarcerated women and their children endured forced labor as penance. Similar practices can be seen in our country's long history of bastardy laws, which made the children of poor unmarried women into wards of the state and forced them to become unpaid indentured apprentice laborers for the land and business owners. And in the post-reconstruction era, new predatory practices also emerged through debt peonage, sharecropping, labor enforcing poorhouse, prison industries, and convict leasing. In this area and others, debt often played a critical role in securing predatory arrangements. Sharecropping, of course, provides one of the most infamous examples. In the wake of the 13th and 14th Amendments, crime and punishment became far more important to organizing basis for predation. The grounds for a post-slavery system of coercive labor extraction orchestrated by state authority. In the North, prison industries turned carceral facilities into factories, and inmates into captive labor pools generating private profits. In the South, chain gangs and conflict leasing contracts were used to reconstruct key elements of the old plantation arrangements. Indeed, if one asks how the South was rebuilt, 
and developed in the century after the Civil War, and how this was accomplished while shielding wealthy white elites from taxation, it's impossible to answer this question without recourse to the racialized predation of prison labor and Coptic lease. Such practices persisted well into the 20th century, and by mid-century, new and varied tactics emerged, particularly around the construction of hyper-segregated residential ghettos. Now, again, much more to be said, um, but this historical survey should suffice to make the point. The liberal development of civil, political, and social citizenship in America was deeply entwined all along the way with shifting practices of predation targeted in different ways, in different areas, by race, class, and gender. In many respects, Dawson and I argue these practices should be seen as the prehistory of criminal justice predation today. And to say this is to suggest that we misunderstand today's extractive fines and fees and all the rest if we only view them, as most observers do, through the narrow lens of crime and punishment. To see their deeper social and political significance, we have to locate them within the broader development of an American political economy that has both liberal and predatory dimensions. And this brings us to our second historical question. How should we explain why today's predatory criminal justice practices emerged when they did and took the form of the Our answer to this question begins by emphasizing that financial takings in the criminal justice field should not be seen as, a, as anomalous practices that have developed against the grain of changes in the broader political economy. The predatory grim, criminal justice practices I've described sail forward with the winds of neoliberal change in their back, in a sense. Since the 1990s, predation in the criminal justice field has shifted substantially from a labor focus to a financial focus. But of course, financialization of this sort is among the most widespread developments in the political economy, treated by many as a defining aspect of our era of capitalism. In fact, predatory financial practices like payday lending and subprime loans have become quite widespread and are concentrated on the same subjugated communities targeted by criminal justice creation. Privatization has transformed the criminal justice field in fundamental ways, significantly advancing financial takings. But of course, privatization has also overtaken and transformed most fields of governance in recent decades. Government agencies' efforts to monetize criminal justice making and practices fit comfortably, we would argue, into the much broader neoliberal process that scholars refer to as the marginalization of the state. The shifting of fiscal burdens from taxpayers to accused and convicted people cast as consumers has been part of a much broader shift in this direction. Court fees, for example, have not grown in isolation. Their timing and growth coincided with broad shifts away from public responsibility funding through progressive taxation, through progressive taxation that demanded more from corporations in the affluent, and toward individual responsibility funding through aggressive fees charged to users. Government budgets for public universities dwindled, and tuition costs for students and their families ballooned. Funding for public parks drew less on public coffers, and more on fees charged to visitors, and so on. Criminal justice targets are hardly the only Americans who have been recast as consumers who must pay individually for their interactions with public institutions. The key point is that the transformation of, criminal, of the criminal justice field has in part reflected the neoliberal reorganization of institutions throughout the state market and society. Now, to connect these things is not to equate them, of course. Predation in the criminal justice field is in many ways distinctive in its operations and intensity and in the ways it is premised on the course of custodial and coordinating capacities of the law enforcing state. We also I would argue, should not see these sorts of connections that I've just been making as a satisfying historical explanation in their own right. Disembodied social forces with names like marketization did not require authorities to monetize criminal justice populations as revenue sources. So we need to complement this sort of interpretation with a more concrete analysis of structures, agents, and relations. Our explanation focuses on the conjunction of three broad developments. The first is the construction of what a 2012 report called the local squeaks. In the last decades of the 20th century, a number of political and policy developments combined to produce immense fiscal pressures on local governments. From the 1970s through the turn of the century, 
federal officials transformed American government governance into a process of policy devolution. From Nixon's new federalism through the Reagan and Clinton eras, public officials pursued numerous strategies for shifting responsibilities downward from federal to state governments and then down from the state to the local level. In the same period, the Reagan administration ended the general revenue sharing program in 1986, sharply curtailing fiscal resources the local governments needed to meet their growing responsibilities. In the U.S. system of federalism, criminal justice is mainly the province of subnational governments. Thus, as federal policies increased federal pressures, I'm sorry, increased fiscal pressures at the state and local levels, they also co-located new revenue needs with political control over criminal justice institutions and practices. As the fiscal obligations grew, local governments borrowed to raise revenues. Through a variety of new bond and credit strategies, municipalities took on large debts that eventually proved very expensive in their own right. Debt service payments to big finance eventually became an ongoing drain on local budgets, deepening the search for new revenues. But this, short, this search was sharply constrained. After California passed Proposition 13 in 1978, nearly all American states restricted local governments' ability to raise tax revenues. These state imposed limits were strengthened by the outsized power of those who held the largest stores of taxable resources, business interests, and the affluent, and by a severely anti tax political climate constructed through political campaigns in the 1970s. Increasingly, state and local governments turned to regressive revenue strategies. State lotteries, various forms of city taxes, new sales taxes, and so on. They diverted federal funding streams that were earmarked for anti property programs into their general funds so that they could be used to pay for basic government operations. They did all of these sorts of regressive maneuvers um, and became dependent on those revenue streams, but none was sufficient to change the basic structural mismatch between needs and resources. And these gathering pressures were transformed into a full-blown fiscal crisis by the Great Recession. As the housing bubble burst and the economy went into a tailspin, local governments suffered dramatic declines in state aid, property taxes, and sales taxes. The atmosphere of fiscal desperation produced a powerful round of austerity politics. Local officials responded by making aggressive cuts to local services. Even in the criminal justice area, bipartisan voices began to call for cost-saving reductions and punishment that had only just recently seemed unthinkable. But in the main, Criminal justice did not follow the cutback pattern of austerity management. And to make sense of this distinctiveness, we have to turn to the second leg of our account, the racialized politics of crime and punishment and more generally security and social order. In the last decades of the 20th century, government's role in ensuring citizen well-being shifted away from an active welfare state, protecting against life risks and hardships toward an aggressive security state, protecting against various threats, internal and external, through police and military powers. Race, of course, played a central role on both sides of this transition, as racialized images of welfare queens and underclass pathologies were deployed to attack social protections. Racialized threats were used to cultivate the fears and needs for protection met by the security state. Street thugs, gangbangers, super predators, polluting waves of immigrants deemed illegal, and a host of diabolical figures and groups designated as enemies of the war on terror. There's no need to rehearse here the broad, bipartisan political story of how criminal justice was transformed as part of this process from the war on crime, through the war on drugs, to broken windows, policing, and all the rest. It suffices to say that by the 1990s, pressures to get tough on crime were racing forward like a political juggernaut making it very difficult for local and state officials to incorporate crime management into the service funding logic of austerity politics. Politicians, judges, district attorneys, and police chiefs rightly feared that slashing budgets and implementing alternatives to arrest, conviction, and incarceration would cause political blowback from voters and from powerful interest groups such as district attorneys associations, prison officer unions, and crime victim organizations. Republican strategists prized tough on crime as an effective wedge issue, an effective race coded wedge issue for peeling off disaffected white Democrats. And Democrats led by the DLC were eager to show voters that they were not at all soft on crime. These barriers to cut 
cutbacks were compounded by the institutional structure of the criminal justice field. Like many other aspects of U.S. government, the U.S. criminal justice system is highly decentralized and fragmented. With primary authorities located in some national governments, there was little opportunity for federal planning and coordination to, to pursue a bold reversal, of course. State and local agencies had more control over crime management, but in most cases, this is crucial, the actors generating costs tended to be different from the ones who bore those costs. Sometimes this worked across the vertical levels of federalism. For example, as local police prosecutors and courts generated waves of costly new prisoners, state budgets bore the burden that state officials could do little to slow the flow. But similar dynamics also operated in the horizontal relations within a given level of scale. For example, consider the adoption of more aggressive saturation-style policing strategies. Even as felony crime rates were falling, this shifted police departments overwhelmed lower courts with higher and more costly caseloads, and there was little that judges or prosecutors could do about it. Institutional fragmentation has tended to be overlooked in discussions of criminal justice takings. The image many people took away from the Ferguson report, which I started with earlier, was of a seamless operation of plunder coordinated at the top and faithfully implemented on the ground. As a generalization, we think that's a misleading image that actually obscures some very important explanatory factors. Institutional factors combined with tough on crime political pressures and discourses to block efforts to curb costs. And on the other side, these very same factors played a positive role in facilitating the turn to revenue generating creation. Get tough political pressures and discourses fueled and worked to legitimate the conversion of criminal justice operations into revenue streams. In the name of getting tough on crime, officials created new violations and added fines and raised fine levels. In the name of protecting taxpayers from a further fleecing at the hands of criminals, they piled up fees of all sorts from pretrial court appearances and on to probation and parole. In the name of public safety, they expanded the scope and size of imposed financial bail obligations. In the name of an aggressive war on drugs and then war on terror, they developed civil asset forfeiture procedures to seize cash and be suspected down these emergencies and so on. These actions appeared to many, it's worth emphasizing, as a win-win, a meeting of virtue and necessity. They were getting tougher on criminals and pursuing public safety more vigorously, upholding victims' rights, and meeting the community's significant fiscal needs all in one school. And while cost containment was hard to coordinate in a fragmented system, projects that promised new revenues required much less cooperation across agencies and actually proved attractive to nearly all agencies involved. Indeed, I'd argue that fragmentation worked to accelerate the process of financialization in some important ways. It allowed diverse actors to innovate simultaneously, developing monetizing strategies tailored to their own positions and needs in the institutional field. It allowed actors in some agencies to observe what others were doing and to emulate or adapt the new revenue techniques they saw emerging elsewhere. And it created opportunities for agencies to piggyback on one another's inventions and thus share in the revenue. An institutional lens is also critical for understanding the distinctively financial turn in criminal justice predations of the 1990s. From slave patrols through convict leasing and beyond, criminal justice codes and practices in the US in US history have predominantly supported labor extraction. What's new here, and what really has to be explained, is the shift in relative emphasis toward practices of financial extraction, which now blossomed beyond any previous experience. To simplify a complex story, we argue that the answer lies, partly at least, in the growth of, in the growth of institutional capacity, the construction of a sprawling system of policing, adjudication, and mass incarceration. Taking a page from Theda Scotch poll, we may say that policy innovations are always shaped and constrained by the nature of available administrative capacities. The less developed criminal justice institutions of earlier eras simply were not large enough to serve as serious instruments for financial takings. Labor supply is something that poor communities offer in abundance, and local public and private interests can benefit from them even in very modest amounts. Even 20 workers for the local business, 10 workers for the local business. 
By contrast, the poor communities of very small amounts of financial resources are spread across large numbers of people. As a result, financial extraction has to occur at a very high level of scale to generate meaningful revenue streams for public and private institutions of any significant size. From this perspective, even the local finance crises of the 1970s happened too early for direct financial extraction to work at a sufficient level of scale. The upward spiral of policing and incarceration was at that time just getting underway. But by the 1990s and all the more by 2007, the necessary conditions of administrative capacities were in place. Specifically, greater administrative scale and capacity made it possible to assimilate the criminal justice field into a process of financialization that was, in these decades, remaking the U.S. political economy as a whole. Finally, growing fiscal pressures and rising criminal justice investments coincided in time with a third key development, the privatization of American governments, government, governments in general. As criminal justice investments grew, market firms were presented with, an attractive, with attractive new opportunities for investment. Their entry accelerated predation and shaped its trajectory. If only fiscal pressures and tough on crime agendas had been at work, we would expect local officials to pursue only changes that enriched government and advanced social control agendas, and to have jealously guarded revenues against market competitors. But that's not what happened. The broader push to privatize state functions and apply market models to governance directly financialized the criminal justice field in new ways. As for-profit actors flooded the field, they brought along the conventional revenue-maximizing focus of market firms and shareholders. These actors also changed the culture and power dynamics in the field, filling criminal justice policy networks with powerful advocates for payment-centered innovations, often brokered to include kickbacks to government so the public officials would support their expansion. Privatization also incorporated criminal justice into a much broader wave of predatory business models developing at the time. Here we find an additional explanation for why criminal justice creation took a financial turn. The growing scale of the penal state made it possible to take small amounts in large numbers, as I said before. But for financial predation of the poor to really pay, you have to solve the problem of how to take what people do not actually have. And in the 1990s, businesses were rediscovering one of the oldest solutions to this puzzle. Debt. Predatory payday lending, subprime auto home loans, high interest credit cards, Home goods, rentals, student loans for for profit colleges, all these practices and more operated as methods for pulling poor people into ongoing extractive relations of debt. As firms invested in criminal justice, they brought these debt imposing models with them. In a sense, large scale privatization operated as a classic story of changing scope and bias. New actors entered the field with pre existing focus on revenues. Their focus matched and in many ways accelerated emerging shifts toward a revenue focus of untraditional public offices of criminal justice. And through this process, the criminal justice field came to operate as a predatory public-private partnership with profound consequences for our nation's subjugating communities, as well as for social inequalities and partners in America. Now, I've covered a lot of ground, can talk for a long time. So I'll end with some brief comments on the city of inequality politics and public policy. Over the past decade, we've made great strides in studying the politics of inequality and clarifying how policy changes have concentrated wealth in what is, among other things, de-democratize the polity. Our leading accounts have rightly emphasized how the richest have pulled away from the rest. But in the process, we've done remarkably little to connect developments at the top of the social order with developments at the bottom. As America has concentrated wealth and shielded it from taxation in recent decades, it has also developed what amounts to a new system of not just regressive, but expropriative taxation, drawing resources out of the poorest communities. To attend to these practices is to remind ourselves that people are not poor in the U.S. simply because of their lack of human capital or the weakness of well-intended social policies. People in this wealthy nation are poor in part because powerful state and market actors work creatively and continually to extract resources from poor communities. In a terrific recent article, Ray Katzenstein and Marie Mahler 
described the new criminal justice regime as a hidden system of taxing the poor through government seizure. But we should ask, hidden from whom? These predatory practices are certainly well known in the communities they target. People who live in poor racial segregated neighborhoods know these practices well. When I go out and see my friends in a bar in a neighborhood that would fit that description, they say, Joe, what are you working on? What's this book about that I heard you I say, well, I'm working on financial takings and blah, blah, blah. They say, well, everybody knows that. Why are you writing a book about that? Everybody knows that. Well, everybody knows that maybe in their neighborhood, but not in every neighborhood. The fact that these practices have remained so invisible to scholars working on inequality, politics, and policy in the U.S. after decades of development is testimony to the fact that so few people in our academic fields have real social groups in these communities. So I'll close by saying that the rich are not the only ones set apart from the rest in the United States, and their distinctive circumstances are not the only ones that pose serious barriers to combating social inequalities and achieving a meaningful democracy. Predatory criminal justice practices today play a vital role in the social and economic hardships, and indeed, in the second class citizenship experienced by large numbers of Americans. No effort to achieve a just and democratic society, now I would argue no scholarly community dedicated to a systematic understanding of inequalities in America can succeed so long as it requires their play. Thank you.
continues to be an important element of criminal justice creation. There is some continuity there, and it's, it's quite important in some ways. But I think people emphasize it in many ways for important reasons. Sometimes it's wrong continuity, uh, going all the way back to slavery and convict leasing and all of this. It's very important um, in those symbolic and political forms, and I think we should be talking about it. But I think your point is absolutely the point that I hope to get across, which is that it is a very small part what's actually going on relative to the financial part of today. That's the big shift here um, in many respects. So it's, it's a point of uh, continuity, but it's, it's also the lesser part. Um, the issue of, uh, you know, the relationship between subjugation uh, and goals of social control um, and the fiscal needs, part of the difficulty in the last part where I was trying to assemble a kind of uh, historical explanation is that the fragmentation and decentralization that I talked about, these practices really emerge in different places for, for different reasons. In many cases, so we're sort of trying to summarize across those, but it's different combinations in different ways. There were times when actors really knew what they were doing. Um, and there were actors like, we, you know, there's so the famous essay in a police magazine where they say, look, um, you know, we're, we are expecting you all these things now, and the political process is pretty unreliable as a source of funding uh, to do what we're doing, and we're, gonna, we, we're at risk, and we need to sort of figure out independent sources of funding. So we need to start developing things like civil asset forfeiture um, in order to be self-funding and in a sense detach ourselves from any sort of democratic political process. That's an exception to the rule. In most places, people did not envision that. They did not say, this is what we need to do. But it happens some, right? So there are lots of examples in courts, for example, of people saying, just when we get into it right now, I'm working on this chapter on discourses and legitimation and, and all this. And there's these amazing examples of people saying, it's good to impose debt on these folks because they're pers they, they lack personal responsibility and self-discipline. This is gonna get them on a structured payment plan. It's gonna force them to work. And this is gonna be rehabilitative, not just in the penological sense, but in the broader uh, neoliberal vision of the citizen as a, as a prudent worker, as a prudent consumer and disciplined worker. Um, so there's, all, there's these different things going on. But I'll say that um, if we go back to the early onset of this, the atmosphere of those fiscal needs and the desperation. You know, there was really this situation in which um, local actors in particular had nowhere to turn. Right? I mean, you look around the university and say, my gosh, how can the state university be charging such incredible prices to, for tuition, for out-of-state tuition? Well, the legislators have told them that they're cutting off the tax base funding for the state university. They told them that they want to protect their constituents and they can't raise tuition uh, for the in-state. Right? There's nothing left, right? And people turn to this. And, and I, I think um, there are choices made here, and I'm trying to, I want to suggest that there are uh, choices that are made and self-justified and there's agency, but deep, deep constraints, very strong pressures. back to the situation in Florida, that was clearly to protect uh, a very strong sports swing state. So in that case, they, no one was concerned about the revenue generated by, by convicts or ex-convicts, excuse me, um, and their fines and fees until they were given the right to vote. And then there was an increased motivation to make sure that we, that population was re of their vote. So that was for political reasons, not for financial reasons. So I would distinguish between uh, the, the two parts here. One is the consequence of having this, which is that the building up of all of these debts creates a, a, a population that can be excluded from their political rights for this reason, once you take away the felony disenfranchisement, right? Um, but in no way were those, was, that, was there an idea at the beginning that we're gonna use this to take away voting rights that drove the development of the criminal justice debts. And right? So here's the- Where we were, if they, if they allowed that to continue, where will it end? Yeah. Will they talk about counting my child support? Will I be, lose my right to vote? If I, you know, where will it end? Yeah, and as I said, there's a number of, of cities at this point who are saying, if you haven't paid off, off all your criminal justice debts, we can, we can terminate your utilities. We can cut off your utilities to your partner house, uh, just simply because you have that. So there's, there's all sorts of things that make you into a kind of second-class citizen 
once you once these debts get established. And again, these debts are established typically on the family members and friends and broader networks in many cases, not just the individual. And just one quick follow-up. Yeah. What we're seeing in schools all over Pennsylvania and in New Jersey, now they're taking away, for students who are behind in their lunch debt, they're taking away food, and then they're taking away extracurricular activities, and now prom, all these things are becoming, because I can't pay my lunch bill, and it's not the kids who can't pay the lunch bill, it's the parents can't pay the lunch bill. So they're in effect of being criminalized in a way. Yeah. So you know, capital accumulation through debt works differently from capital accumulation through labor exploitation, right? So under labor exploitation, you have to employ me, in a sense, to generate value through my labor. But with debt, it becomes a generalized status, such that I can go work for anybody, and you're still going to get some of my money because I have to pay off my debt continually. So it doesn't matter where I work, or frankly, maybe even if I work. Right? If I can come up with the money, maybe in the list of money or whatever, I can pay. And so debt is carried around by the individual um, in a way that is quite generalized and serves as a status that can be further exploited. Predation, in many ways, in our study, we define predation in terms of uh, the leveraging of people's social positions, subjugation in various ways, their needs and aspirations and, and various things that arise from their social positioning, right, and support their relationship, the leveraging of that to extract revenues in various ways. And so debt itself then becomes a marker that can make someone subject to further right, takings. So my question is a little bit of a public go forward from the institution which you're which you describe. Mm -hmm. And I think I think the model you present about how a state can be contractual and credited for different subsections of the population very quickly. And uh, you discussed as well how this interacts with race in America, right? Um, but in very ethnically homogeneous societies, you know, like uh, State or Sweden law, like uh, I think to some extent over the last century, we have a story where we go from a society that is contractual for some people and predatory towards very poor people, right? Like uh, uh, sort of a class of uh, day farmers in Spain or workers in the 30s and etc., like mine workers, and uh, Getting to more contractual societies in these ethnically homogeneous societies is already extremely challenging, right? Like, it's mainly uh, like a leading argument about why we have a civil war is because the, it, 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 like, all personal discusses how. Anyway, uh, and the point is, uh, recent research suggests that uh, ethnic fragmentation or ethnic heterogeneity in a society reduces preferences for redistribution, for example. So, it should, and as you discuss, it, Text, uh, with this uh, division between a contractual and a predatory society to some extent. So my question is, in an ethnically, how do you surmount this challenge? Right? Like this, in an ethnically homogeneous society, it's already very challenging to move from a partially contractual, partially predatory society to a state, to a just contractual state that is for everyone. But like, how would you do this with the added challenge of uh, of ethnic heterogeneity. And I, I know this is a hard question and it goes beyond the scope of research, but I thought you might have given some thought because of the work you have done. Yeah, um, it's a great question. Uh, and I'll turn it suddenly in, in a direction of something I want to talk about, which is resistance to political organization right now. I guess one part of what I'd say is uh, the answer is you fight like hell. Um, and, and the reason you bother to do that is because I don't think that. Um, population compositions of racial diversity or destiny um, in any sort of way. Um, and I think we have uh, observed lots of change historically. Um, uh, things get better in some ways, they get worse in other ways. There are, there's movement in lots of different directions. Rogers has written about this quite a bit. Um, and, and I think that, um, that there's nothing that, that prevents us from making progress. You know, the last book that I wrote was a book called Discipline of the Poor. It was about welfare reform. And it was so depressing at the end because I saw absolutely no way that those systems were going to get any better anytime soon. At least this book is, in many ways, more depressing in terms of practices of what's being done. But it's actually much more optimistic for me because these are such recent developments since the 1990s. I mean, this is, I mean, I'm 52 years old. This is quite recent, in my opinion, right? Um, 
this is, you know, this is very recent. We did not have these practices not that long ago. And people are mobilizing against these practices and they're winning victories. We won a big Supreme Court victory in Timothy and in Indiana and it's a classic forfeiture recently. Just this past week, California became the first state in the United States of America uh, to ban uh, future contracts with private, um, privately managed prisons and detention centers in any sort of way. There's been all sorts of uh, prison labor strikes and Black Lives Matter movements and other movements have had this on their agenda and have been pushing. There have been lots of local developments, particularly around imposition of fees around juvenile detention centers. There's been lots of action happening. It's actually uh, a pretty vibrant area of political action. And so, the, and so the big question that you're asking about how do we get a just society among diversity in some ways, I'm not sure I can take that on at, at this point here. But in terms of the practices that I've been talking about today, I actually think there's great reason to think that with the right kinds of political pressure from below and changes in terms of uh, representation, that we can actually make a quite a bit of progress in trying to go back these things. There's a lot of energy here and a lot of creativity that needs our help. cost of collection. Uh, you impose them, you impose debt, and then you can't collect. Um, I'll just say that, uh, and I think there's a reason why people emphasize this argument. I don't, I'm not saying that it's disingenuous. I'm just saying it's also strategic. And the strategic part is they want to say to state managers, this is an irrational practice. You're not actually doing very well financially at it, so you should abandon it. Right? I think people are doing very well. Um, at this. I think I don't buy the argument that billions and billions of dollars are being taken out of communities and they're disappearing and nobody's um, benefiting from it in some way. I think that in many ways we're all implicated in the extent to which our society is being subsidized in, in important ways by this. Um, I think what I would say to start with is um, if we look at that particular case you were talking about, um, let's say the people in jail, it's expensive to have people in jail, so is it rational um, if they can't pay? We're putting them in jail for other Reasons. We're putting them in jail for reasons uh, that have to do with race and crime and punishment, politics and all these other things. We're already doing that, right? We're not arguing in any way, and I would not buy the argument, that we pursued putting people in jail as a rational strategy to make money. That doesn't wash. But when you're doing that, it's extremely expensive. And if you can defray the expenses by taking money from people that you're putting in jail, right, that's going to be politically palatable to those who are taxpayers who don't want to pay the bill, right? And they're actually going to see it as getting tougher from the, on the criminals. And it's also going to generate revenue, right? So that's the- We do in prison people who can't pay the traffic fine, right? So they're yeah. in jail before, and if they can't pay it, then they go to jail. That's right. right. That's right. There are cases like that, although they're a, they're a fairly small number overall, right? But the threat of that prison actually generates more payments. But the bigger point, the bigger point I want to make is how how distinctive that particular case is that people focus our attention on when they do that. The corporations charging for stuff in prisons, the commissary, the phone calls, the video, those are, they're getting paid in real time. And they're making the money. The, the state and local officials taking stuff through civil asset forfeiture, they're taking the assets in real time. There's no question of collecting on the debts, right? And even in the case of the debts that people owe, 
um, places are getting quite aggressive um, in trying to convert that into real money. As I said, canceling people's utilities um, when they ha until they've paid, right? Things like that. Um, impounding things, garnishing wages. Uh, there's all kinds of things that are going on. And there's also now secondary debt markets where they essentially, you know, make, they securitize their Excel spreadsheets of all of the, the debts that they're owed and they sell them on the debt markets. And then, yes, yeah, it's, it's not full payment, but they're they're making money off of it. So there's a lot of be money being taken here. And I would argue there's a lot of money being made. And I understand the political value of wanting to go and in a sort of rational policy analytic way say, uh, this is an irrational policy and it doesn't make money, but I don't actually buy it. Yeah. Uh, thank you. My question is, pardon me, in this current climate where we have such a array of media outlets and social media outlets where you have the constant discussions of Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, moral justice reform and things like that. I have kind of two questions. Number one, in your research, do you have a racial percentage of how many of these crimes or the things that led to these deaths were nonviolent versus violent? And then secondly, do you, can you share a little bit about how if the, if, if the DOJ is doing this research and you're doing these studies, then in a climate where you talk about the war on drugs and we still the war on drugs been for minorities and people of color, where now it legalized some weed and, and now there's uh, opiate injection sites and things like that. Mm -hmm. Have you found the trace between the money that's being generated from these fees is that being funneled back into now these new initiatives for other cultures to capitalize on what was once a minority problem? Um, so the last thing you're asking about is whether the money generated through the war on drugs is now going into the drug industry. In some ways, I'm not sure about that. I don't know anything about that language. But what I and but what I and I can't necessarily say anything about the percentage of violent and nonviolent offenses. The first. Question you ask. But what I but what I can say is that you know part of what's happening with um, the deaths, uh, the, kill, the police killings uh, in many cases, is that we have no research on this. But you know if you look at these cases, it is remarkably common for one of these killings, um, when it involves a pedestrian or uh, driving or anything like that, to open up onto. Uh, this issue of predation. That this person would be getting pulled over repeatedly. Right? Michael Brown was a pedestrian, he was walking, he was pulled over for walking, going to give, be given a citation. And then Philando Castile uh, in the high town of St. Paul, Minnesota, I know that case best. But Philando Castile got pulled over and the police shot him after he said that he had a weapon in the car, which was legal. Right? Came out after um, the fact of the investigation. Leonard Castillo had been pulled over 82 times and given citations in recent years. He had $7,000 in debts from fines and fees. Of the 82 times Leonard Castillo had been pulled over, 40 of them, half, were for driving without a valid license. And it was suspended because he couldn't pay off his fines and fees. And so if Leonard Castillo was driving to make lunches for school children several blocks from my home, right? And getting pulled over, he had to drive to get the money to pay off his debts to get his driver's license back. But every time he drove, he risked getting pulled over. By the way, he was never pulled over for a violation of speeding or anything like that. They were all for a tail light, not wearing his seat belt allegedly, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, right? And so and this happened, this seems to be happening again and again. My my hypothesis would be, because I don't have evidence, but my hypothesis would be that when you have revenue center policing, you're pulling people over more and more and more in the context um, of racist attitudes and stereotypes, you're increasing the odds that you're going to have, you're having more interactions and you're increasing the odds of one of these going to go very, very bad. And someone is going to lose their life, typically a uh, person of color,
and yet you flew today and you probably might have gotten a fee if you had carry on bag, right? And even if you have a carry on bag and then checking it, you might have that. So we've gotten used to those fees in the society. And then second of all, we have a bigger issue of debt, of all kinds of debt within the society. And some of the Tea Party movement was fueled by people saying we shouldn't forgive this foreclosure, even though many people were hurt very bad by the financial crisis. And so the conference we were at a couple of weeks ago in Boston, right, there was, there's really a question about, you know, judge by judge, person by person, county by county, and educate this. Yeah. And we have many young people who say, you know, I want to work on this through a criminal justice lens, and this is the way, and it's such a, a fragmented system. Or do we fundamentally have to talk about capital and the political economy and changing the tax policy and rebuilding revenues? And that seems to me the way to go, which then is a much more pessimistic view, but much more, maybe much more hopeful because many young people today are fundamentally questioning capitalism and that. So I, I'm concerned about this kind of step by step we have a movement where all of your analysis is that this is actually much about the deeper political economy. Oh, that's extremely well said. Um, I I guess I would say um, that I don't want to quite oppose those things as, as mutually exclusive. I think that there's a lot of field-specific reform movements, a lot, of, a lot of victories that are being won within this specific field. But I think that you're absolutely right that, um, that what I've tried to argue today is that this is part of something much broader in the transformation of society. And that, you know, when you listen to judges um, and various officials justifying, um, back up, when, uh, at the very beginning of this nation, right, um, we rejected the idea of charging defendants, right, to be in court. That was something that was done in England, uh, but it was seen as, as a terrible practice, and actually, if anyone to pay that was an individual, it's the person who was asking for the administrative service of detaining this person and prosecuting them. They're the person, they're not the person who is, who is getting charged, right, in some sort of way. And there's this, this long history of that, and it's amazing how we, we've reached this moment in which it's so normalized through this market language. And when you listen to the defenses and justifications of various officials, they say things like, you know, well, if you go to Nordstrom's or buy a dress, you expect to pay for it. If you come to the court, right, if you screwed up and you committed a crime, and you have to come to court, you're gonna to have to pay for it. In some sense, as if it's this part of your transaction, and as if you're being charged, is evidence that you have committed the crime and screwed up, right? In some way. So there's this notion of people have to come into the other But so question. I think that um, we have to fight within the field because field specific. Uh, injustices speak directly to the communities that suffer those, and we will not get change without mobilizing the communities that are experiencing the injustices, which means naming what the nature of that injustice is. On the other hand, I think that this is inseparable from all of this broader stuff, um, and it's very un and, and there are limits to how deep that change will go if you don't get the broader changes uh, that you're talking about. Yeah. And I think we need to have students feel a lot of that they don't know why they're not going to show that. Yeah. And I think, you know, so here if I could just uh, step back to the analytic point a little bit, to the extent that people have been connecting um, what's happening in criminal justice to uh, neoliberal political economy, it's often in this way of saying um, that. You know, we in this sort of post-industrial era that there's um, that there's a lot of surplus populations out there, disposable populations that there aren't jobs for, it, and that uh, the social insecurities related to that have been sort of mopped up and warehoused in some sort of way. And it's expensive, but it reduces the social insecurities. Part of what Josh and I are arguing is that that's sort of incomplete. It's not entirely false. But it is incomplete insofar as it ignores the fact that actually these aren't surplus disposable populations. They've been, they've been made very productive for various um, actors. That there are uh, lots of corporations 
doing very, very well. There are taxpayers being subsidized in various ways because they're not having to pay taxes for various things, etc. Um, yeah. uh, well, my question follows on that, and it's a, a very powerful presentation. Um, I like the fact that if I understand you correctly, uh, you're not suggesting that uh, mass incarceration arose exclusively or primarily because of financial benefits, but that as we develop institutions of mass incarceration, it provided opportunities that have created uh, extensive practices of um, predatory um, extraction. Um, given that that has occurred, though, uh, now we are hearing um, talk that uh, uh, we're moving beyond the era of mass incarceration and that um, you know, those like the Cato Institute against big government are deciding that we should um, uh, move away. And we have had some changes in mandatory sentencing laws and other things. We've also had some devolution of criminal justice functions. But if you're right that we now have built up an elaborate apparatus uh, that uh, gets a lot of profit out of our system of mass incarceration. Can we be very optimistic uh, that the era of mass incarceration really has reached a turning point and that we're getting away from it? Yeah. No, we can't be optimistic about it. Well, I, you know, I, um, we should have, I think. Uh, you know, there are very significant path dependent dynamics at work here. Uh, you know, we have sort of we built these institutions. Uh, various actors invested in these institutions, they now rely on these institutions. Uh, we rolled back uh, taxation at the top and stopped getting as much revenue from the top, and we now develop these systems. Cities all around the country are reliant on these revenues in various ways. They've spent them, they count on them coming in. Uh, this is not going to be easy to undo in, in a large sense, and not only those uh, positive feedback kind of loops make it difficult not only to change these policies, but also to, to end something like mass incarceration. And while it's true that there have been some downward trends um, in recent years, incarceration, what, what's the number? Something like it would take 75 years at this rate uh, to get back to where we were um, prior to this huge run up. I mean, we're, you know, we're a very, very long way from not doing this. And there are very strong barriers. It would take um, a very, very significant kind of social disruption, I think, uh, at this point, to, to make that happen. Um, Prison um, stock prices 
right, afterwards, the next two months. And part of the reason for that was because they knew it was going to open up this massive new arena of immigrant detention was going to just explode. It's, it's incredible how much money is going into in that right now. Uh, justification and legitimation, I think it's, uh, it, obviously you could talk about it for a long time, we'll let it talk, but, um, but there's, I would say that there's uh, three sort of broad areas. The, the first is the sort of uh, market, market justifications. Um, all of these consumer um, you know, discourses that are around the idea that you're using the services, you should have to pay for them, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it, it, it's interesting because in the criminal justice field, we usually talk about discourses of deviance that sort of set people apart. And these are actually normalizing discourses. They're discourses that say, oh, uh, look, this person being treated like anybody. You, you got to pay if you need that. And so there's, and there's all sorts of things. That, and oftentimes, a sort of service to the individual that, oh, we're, you know, this person is being offered access to a book. Um, and all of the books out there that they can get on e-books, right? Um, it's way better than, than the prison library. Of course, the prison library is free, right? Now they're being charged every time, you know? And so there's all of these sorts of things that, that sort of work in that consumer model, expanding choice, you know? Then there's a set of security and criminal-centered uh, things, and there's three basic things that sort of go on there. One is um, the idea of a tool of, of crime funding, that you're punishing people for crimes. Um, we're going to use civil asset forfeiture um, to uh, make sure that they can't keep all the ill-gotten gains. And we're going to punish them in this way, and even it's worse to have your stuff taken away from these people than to be put in prison or something where the buddies are. You see, it's crazy that you know, this, right? And then the notion that that money is going to pay for law enforcement, right? So you see places like the West Tennessee Drug Task Force has up on their thing, I mean, on their cars, paid for by the criminals, no taxpayer funds used, right? Um, and so they're sort of very much holding this device on. So in, in contrast to the normalizing discourse, this sort of deviance device. Um, and then there's sort of this uh, dehumanizing element to the criminal discourses in which, um, you know, groups are treated in some ways as beyond our human sympathy or empathy. Um, in no way should we get it's, it's striking in the Ferguson report. There's a line that's sort of hideous and, and paranoid. You know, they, here are these people who, I mean, the Ferguson was so out in the open. They knew that they were being told from the top to, to collect all these revenues. They knew what they were doing. And yet, they told themselves that it was about crime fighting and that these, these people lack personal responsibility and need to be policed. And I think that there's this um, email chain in which they're all joking with one another. And that, uh, the city officials and the police uh, about a black woman's abortion being a method of crime control, right? Um, and and so you know there's this dehumanizing element that, that goes on, and then there's this rehabilitative, we're rehabilitative thing that these that um, this is going to be good because people are going to have to work to pay off their debts, and they're going to have to, and they're being held responsible for something. And you see these people saying absurd things like, for the first time in their life, they're probably being made to actually pay. And you see this discourse of makers and takers, and it's very twisted where they say, you know, um, finally these people are being made to pay their fair share. This neighborhood is full of the welfare queens, the people who've been stealing, and, you know, and now they're finally being made to pay up. And yeah, we're going and we're giving all these tickets, we kind of know what we're doing, but you know what, in the grand scheme of things, it's fair. Right? And then the last thing that I point to is um, this neoliberal sort of era of the loss of the notion of countervailing powers in some way this notion of public service partnership um, that you have these corporations coming in and making money hand over for this um, in the name of corporate social responsibility and being good citizens um, and in many ways being good partners to government they, and they're celebrated for the work that they do and they celebrate themselves for the work they do um, and in many ways uh, you know, it's this classic thing of, you know, corporations now have the rights of citizens in all sorts of ways, right? And they get to claim them. And, and being good, good corporate citizens, at the same time, they get to claim of being the agents of the state. Um, and so many ways you see in this field all sorts of justifications of, of civic partnership. Um, and, you know, what goes on citizens, a predatory public-private partnership. Thank you so much.